Good evening, everyone. My name is Tamir Massas. I'm from Israel. I'm very excited to be here. And uh, I want to start with uh, thanks to Chong Ansonim. Uh, it's, it's really a privilege for me to come here and practice with you and have uh, first wonderful food. So thanks for the cooker, the kitchen master. That's very important. And for all the groups that come and practice, that's for me, it's very important. A few words about myself for some people that uh, don't know me. Uh, I'm 41 years old. I marry and I have uh, three boys. And uh, we live uh, in the center of Israel, around 20 minutes from Tel Aviv. For me to come and practice, it's uh, very important. And because I am a layman, not a monk anymore, so for me it's very important how we can combine the practice with relationship. Because we are all in relationship, maybe in romantic relationship or any kind of relationship. There is a few points that I want to uh, point out today. Uh, there is many points actually, but only a few. I will point out from our practice. I think this practice, it's really a unique practice. And um, as much as we understand how to combine it to everyday life, especially from my point of view in relationship, we can make some more harmony. And that's something that really for me, uh, very important. The Buddha said that uh, 80% from our problem, it's connect to relationship. So somebody once asked, so what about the other 20%? So maybe you ask the Buddha, I don't know about the other 20. I think 100% from our problem connect to relationship and whatever we want to get in our life, connect to somebody. We cannot get it alone. Need somebody approve, somebody permission, somebody to help you, somebody share with you something. We are not alone. So our practice, it's very unique in that sense. And I want to point a few things from our practice that for all of us to take and to train ourselves. The first point, it's very interesting because we are all sitting here and we suppose just to sit. We are willing just to sit. Maybe we practice mantra, question, breathing, just observe the sound and space, but we willing just to sit. Just to sit in relationship, it's very interesting, not just on the cushion. Because just to sit in relationship mean, from my point of view, and I'm still investigated, I'm still inquired that, mean to be in the presence of ourselves in front of the other person. I mean, when we meet somebody, somebody, something happened to us. Maybe some of us stop to breathe. Somebody choke. Somebody's stomach is painful. Especially if somebody is looked to you higher than you. You define him higher than you, then you start to feel uncomfortable. The point of just sit, just to sit in relationship, it's a moment to stop and just be aware. What happened to you? Usually when people are not aware what happened to them, they will start to speak fast or they fill the room with many words or to feel uncomfortable and start to move and the body is not comfortable inside. There is many things that happen when we feel unpleasant. So just sit when you do it in the cushion. Please take it in front of others. It's let us to stop and see what happened in our body. What happened in our face? How the breath is shallow or still deep? We don't handle the breath. We come into interaction and what happened happened? <laughs> it's like that. So we say our karma can come over. And if I have the habit of being angry, I will react angry. If I have the habit to be in fear, I will try to avoid, so avoid situation. So just it is the first point that I'm wishful for all of us to take into relationship. 
The second point is not to move. We try not to move on the cushion, but we always move, but we try not to move. Not moving, it's like we say, sitting like a mountain. If you walk around and see the mountain, the mountain teaches something very interesting. They don't move. Sometimes storm come, but the mountain doesn't move. It doesn't react to the storm. We are not like that as human. Something happen and we open our mouth and ah, we, we say something. Oh, we try to close and avoid the situation. So not moving, and we talk about three things not to move. Not to move in your body. We keep silence, so not moving in your tone. That's very important. Sometimes you say something and then you're so sorry about it. What can you say? I'm sorry. It's already done. The feeling is already appeal, okay? And then the mind, not moving. So you can just perceive the situation without any judgmental, any criticize, any opinion. It's very rare situation, but it's possible when you learn not to move. Not moving teaches something very important. Stop our blind reaction. Usually, as human, we don't stop to think before we open our mouth and say something. So, yeah, here we learn not to think, okay? <laughs> Return to this point, then reflect action. But in daily life, relationship, sometimes you need to stop and think. Not to stop what you want to say, but how do you want to say that? In which way will you say the things that you want? Or it's important for you. That's very important, not to move. That gives you a moment, okay, before reaction appear. And the last thing, it's the most challenge. It means do nothing. In relationships, don't react or don't do anything. Sometimes very difficult, especially if the storm comes. And I have to tell you, I have three boys. There is lots of storm. For me, it's morning time. I need to arrange the three of them. And sometimes it's not so easy. So the storm come, but you shouldn't move. You shouldn't say anything. And the most difficult or most challenging, it's do nothing. Do nothing in relationship, as much as I understand that, is to put down, I know and I'm right, especially in relationship. I know and I'm right, ruin any kind of relationship. So these three points, very simple points, okay? Just sit, don't move, and do nothing. Try to take it into your relationship. That's very interesting. What can be happen? What can we afford? What kind of situation will renew or happen in our life? So in Israel, when I teach, it's not look yet like that. It's, for me, it's the highest class to practice like that. As I learned in, uh, uh, in Korea when uh, Chong Ansoning was the head monk and I was just a semini, very young uh, monk. Even before Hengja, we were, I was there. Uh, in Israel, I tried to right away throughout the meditation practice. If it's bowing or chanting or sitting or walking meditation, any kinds of what we are practicing here, how we can bend it to relationship. I really believe that if we can make our relationship a place that we can grow in compassion, harmony, and peace, it's affect straight our practice. And our practice will affect straight our relationship. If it's possible to make peace between us, I really believe that this is the way. So hopefully you took something from my introduction. And I'm uh, happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, can you please tell us something about uh, the, the, the points that are the same and different in relationships in the temple and the relationships uh, outside? Do you want to live in a temple? No. <laughs> it's very interesting. Not yet. Not yet, okay. 
It's always very interesting for me why somebody asks this question, especially when they ask a general question. What's the personal part? I think it's just a general question. Okay, so I give a general answer, okay? <laughs> Living monk's life, monkhood, okay, in temple, it's very interesting because you can become very close, even without a female relationship or female, you know, man relationship, no romantic relationship, you can feel very close to some people. They always want to support you and take care of you. And sometimes, I don't know if it's the right word to say now, but it was kind of embarrass me. You know, I need a blanket, I get 10 blankets. What, what I'm gonna do with all the ten blanket. blanket? You know, it's really warm feeling and kindness and very close. This is was my situation, okay, in the temples where I live. Outside relationship can be also close. I don't want to sound that cannot be close, but sometimes the circumstances, the outside situation, can really affect relationship. And each one of us can look only for myself, only for me. Not so much think about the other. There is a wonderful principle nowadays, even in a business situation, about win-win situation. Okay, I, I'm sure you heard about it. It's a good first, but you need to really pay attention and time to thought, to think about how can we make it a win-win situation. So, I really believe that uh, living in a monastery, living in a temple, in that sense, really support practice and relationship, in that sense. Outside, I feel more challenge in relationship. It, there, is, oh, there isn't always very clear cut what to do. You need to find some time away. It's not always straight to the, to the point. So, this is as much as I can be a general. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to ask you, what brought you to Korea to practice there? If I'm not mistaken, if it's, and if it's not too much of a private information, you're a son of a rabbi. And why on earth did you seek some consolation or whatever you saw it there in Korea. How did it affect that because of what you went there? And after leaving there, how come you became a mundane person or layman, as you said it? What do you do in real life, if I can <laughs> call that? So in everyday life. First, I went to Korea because I live on Earth, which means I suffer then I had to do something with my own suffering. I will tell you, it's not a personal, I use it for teaching, so it's not my story, you know, anymore. When I was uh, eight years old, my parents decided to divorce. I'm the oldest son. I could see what happened to a relationship. But, you know, it's very interesting to explore this from a point of view of a child. As much as we understand, as much as was in my family, the fighting was in the room. Outside, good face, I see them. So I didn't know what happening, really. And then one day they come and they say, okay, we divorce and you will stay, live with your mother and I go. You know, it's very interesting because a child doesn't understand that he will meet his father once in two weeks, all kinds of, you know, arrangement. When you say, I go, it's for, it's for gone, that's it, it's finished. Then, uh, when I grow between eight to 12 years old, I didn't know how, even how to, to call it, to name it, but I had lots of pain in my belly, lots of sadness, and I didn't know how to deal with this. I was very young age. And at the age of 12, I thought I found a solution for my pain. As a young boy, 12 years old, I thought that if I will have a girlfriend, no sadness, no loneliness. 
You know, 12 years old. This is what I could think about it, okay? And it's, it, it's true. The first, I had a girlfriend, she was two years above me, and she loved me and admired me, and all the sadness, all the pain in my belly completely disappeared. But then after one month, one month and a half, all the pain started to arise again. Between the age of 12 to 22, I changed more than 10 romantic, really, I love them, each one of them. No game, really love them, a lot. But each time, after one month and a half, two months, it's broke. Or I left, or she left. At the age of 22, I understand something very important. I understand that if I will reach something outside, it will change something inside, this is illusion. The thing that when I feel unpleasant, I try to look for something outside to change my own feeling. I realize it very clearly. Then I start to look for a place. And it wasn't clear like today you look Google, where should I go to practice? And there is many. It was 97, so I just walk around different countries and actually, by mistake, not mistake, arrive in South Korea. It's not a place that you are going traveling, or even we are going in a backpacker, you know, India, Thailand, Laos, Burma, all this. Thing. Somebody said there is three months silence retreat in South Korea. I said, oh, this is wonderful. Okay, I go it. <laughs> I was 22 years old. <laughs> and for me, it was the best because, you know, we don't feel comfortable in one place, so we can change, you know, go back home. Maybe we live from here one hour, two hours, three hours, something like that. But you can't leave South Korea, come back home. <laughs> it's quite far to Israel. So in the first few weeks, every day, noontime, I couldn't sit because too much pain. I just walk the mountain every day. Then slowly, slowly start to practice. So for me, it's the best thing that I don't forget where I come from. And I know it can happen any moment. Things change. You believe that everything is okay, everything fixed, situation is okay, wonderful. Something happened, it's change. So at very young age, I could experience that very strongly. This is why I went to South Korea. I didn't know if, I don't know if I answer all your question, but... Uh, this no, actually, from. there was a third part. When you left Korea, yes. Then how? Why, why didn't you uh, become a monk, and why did you go back to have a family? And 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 how does your family react relate to your not mm. doing anything mm. <laughs> or trying not yeah. to anyway? <laughs> the first day, uh, I went to Korea for three months, Kyolche, Then. I understand this is the best place to practice if you love the practice. They take care of that everything for you. You don't need to take care of that anything. Food, clothes, you sick, somebody will take you to the doctor, he will arrange everything. Everything is well care. And I understand that if I want to go deep into the practice, twice a year, Kyolche, three months retreat, that's the best place. So I stayed for, for that few years. But I always thought about having family in that sense. And I knew that, as I told you the story of me, it's lonely, lonely feeling was kind of shaped my whole decision. I do things not to meet loneliness, not to experience loneliness. So I went after four years uh, practicing in the temple, I went to Myanmar, Burma, to get a kuti, it's called. It's a small, very small room in the middle of the forest. Once a day you beg for the food, and this is really what they give you, it's wonderful when you eat once a day. And you only by yourself. You need to make a schedule and just follow it. And for 120 days, I only stay over there with my pain and practice. And then at the end, I knew 
I go back home. I want to bring this to Israel. I want this kind of peace mind that I experienced on the cushion teach in Israel. When I came to Israel, I knew that I want to make family. I really want to... First, it's kind of an uh, egoistic reason, but this was the reason at the time, to see if this peace mind, clear mind, also can combine with the family situation. It's kind of challenging yourself. It's very, in a way, clear and not so easy, but it's quite clear situation as a monk's life, especially in South Korea. So I came home and uh, started to, I became a Dharma teacher at the time. The Zen master ordained me as a Dharma teacher and then start to teach and, you know, the rest is the history. <laughs> like that. Thank you. I have a question regarding uh, how you raise your sons if they are more or less uh, 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 grow up with uh, contents of Zen Buddhism like meditation and, and so on. Uh, if you compare your children now with uh, with children who join them in school, for example, what what differences do you see, or which advantages? So, I guess there are more advantages than disadvantages, of course. Yeah, but uh, do you do you see any any uh, difference from my point of view? I would say, as soon as you learn about all these tools and techniques from Zen, the better. But uh, how is your point of view on that? First, I don't compare. I don't know about other children. I don't deal with other children. I try to teach my children how to handle situation. I really believe that what we teach them today, in 20 years, it will be useful. It won't be really helpful for them. Because this world changed so fast jobs, economic situation, business, everything changed so fast. What can I teach him now that will be good when he will finish, you know, all the kind of graduation and everything and reach the real life. So I try to teach them how to handle situation. For example, how to control their breath. Okay, before you answer, take a deep breath. It's something very simple, but for children it's not so simple, I have to say that, okay? They have lots of energy. The last year they came with us, I, I bring a group and I bring both of my uh, boys, the oldest and the middle. And we were sitting, but I cannot sit so much, okay? So they were around here making noise and everything, you know. and. They could do whatever they like to do, you know. We sometimes, when we see Chong Sunim and some of us maybe feel stressed and not so comfortable, but the children doesn't have that. My middle can sit on him, can jump on him, can play with him, like that. So always try to teach them how to handle the situation. Another example to give you, my oldest son, Elor, he came here twice and he tried to sit with us a few times. And I told him only to observe the sensation, the body. And then when he reached some pain, only stop and just breathe slowly, slowly to the pain. Breathe out slowly, slowly from the pain. And it was very interesting because a few days later, he said to me, oh, Dad, I was at school and I had a headache. I didn't drink so much, so I had a headache. Israel is a very hot country, okay? No. So he said, okay, I just focus on the pen and I just breathe to the pen. And the pen disappeared. So I try every time to teach them very small tools, how to handle things in their life, how to even choose the way they react, the way they approach things. That's the best that I can do now. Nothing more than that. What they like, they will learn. And you know, in the future, what they love, they learn. The 
when I came here, before I came here day, two days ago, uh, the day before I came here, uh, they almost finished, graduated the class. This is the end of the year in Israel. So my uh, older son said, uh, we had a conversation about studying. Say, said, okay, it's very important to study. Then you can reach things, you can do things, whatever you like, you explore yourself. And he said, why do you ask me? Only fourth grade. He's like nine years old, okay? He said, why do you ask me to study at school? You study only what you like. Why do you choose for me to study everything? And they already understand. If they don't like something very difficult, in a way to force them to study it. So I try to really help them to find what they really love. And try to do it. Nothing special. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I hope I have a question because I'm uh, very nervous, and that's uh, that's my uh, my thing, um, the fear. And I was wondering, can I um, approach the fear? Uh, what you say, just sitting, and um, can it help to to um, reduce the fear? Because I <laughs> I hear sit still and I think no I don't want to sit still because I did all my life sit still because the fear blocked me and and I avoid all relationships so I don't know what the question <laughs> what do I want to uh, ask you but um, what can I do what uh, for for the for the fear. Um, Yeah. Actually, for the fear, don't do anything. We just come and go, okay? There is three things that people will do everything to avoid. One of them is fear. The other is embarrassment. And the third is something that looks to you unknown. You won't do. Okay, three things. Fears, embarrassment, and unknown. You don't know the result. Sometimes you will give up even before you try. Okay, three things. Fear. What is fear? I ask you. What is fear? What is fear? Uh, I experience as a, uh, um, as a big energy. Um, that's my experience. Uh, it's a, a big energy that, that is... Uh, blocks me of uh, stand. Uh, it's it's here. I feel it here. It's uh, it's kind it's kind of power. Okay, where in your body you feel this energy? <laughs> where where? <laughs> where? Yeah. <laughs> most here. But most here. Almost okay. everywhere. Oh yeah. So. Okay, what do you feel or sense here? What's what's going on here? Not a metaphor, a sensation. Yeah. Martin, did you notice what happened to you <laughs> when you start looking into it? Were aware what happened to you when you look? Yeah. What happened? <laughs> it <laughs> was less uh, uh, um, fear. Less fear, but and also, how could I see it? You didn't move. So if you want to walk with fear, be focused on it. What is fear? What is the sensation of fear? The sensation you can handle. The metaphor, your thinking, it will kill you. It's like two different parts, okay? When fear arises, doesn't matter what happened in the situation, fear arises, okay? If you go to your thinking, you're dead. Don't believe me, try again. But if you go to your body and just be close to that sensation, you will see something very interesting. Actually, there is no fear. Fear is a label to something that you sense. Perceive this sensation and just be intimacy with this sensation. Be close. Be very, very close.
become one with that sensation, we say. And then where is that fear? But you think fear, it control all your situation. Control all what you say, what you act, everything. So for me, it wasn't so much fear. For me, it's loneliness. This is my backpack, okay? This is my karma, okay? I sit a lot with loneliness. Still now, the sits come, okay? It's in my belly too. My belly is like squeezing, like that, Ugh. okay? Just be intimacy with that. Then you see it's calm, stay for some time, disappear. That's all. The next time it's calm, I already saw this movie. It doesn't really affect so much. After some time, it's only a movie, that's all. It's a cloud now in the sky. Soon the cloud go, the sky is blue, don't worry. This is the attitude I develop towards my loneliness. So I don't want to make illusion that you will never experience again fear, but I would like you to change your relationship with fear. That's a transformation. Okay, with human, we will feel fear and loneliness, anxiety, anger. This is being human. How do you relate to that? Try it. Thank you, you for the personal answer, a question. Could give a personal answer, thank you. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, you also have a personal more. question? No, it's, it's actually connected <laughs> No, directly you want to talk about him. <laughs> because, no, no, it's, it, I think it affects everybody, so it's, it's, okay. it's uh, <laughs> definitely nothing, uh, not a secret or something like that. But uh, as far as it, I, I understood it, and you mentioned also a movie, or, but uh, it rem just came up to my mind now. It sounds like uh, in the movie The Godfather when he said, uh, <laughs> keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Is that right? To become intimate with my fear? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about Godfather. Maybe <laughs> he sent and just kill it. I, I don't know about that. Okay? But I'm talking about our body. It's a wonderful tool. We need to more appreciate our body and take care of it. And actually everything you keep in your body. And this is the good news. It's not the bad news. You don't need to avoid your body. If you treat your body well, once something appears in your body, you can contemplate on it. You can observe it. You can perceive it. Whatever word you like, okay? Then, then a sense of power appear that you can be aware but not lost. Then you can see it's true nature. It's calm, stay for some time, and it's disappear. Why worry about that? Why go and act from that? Sometimes we feel unpleasant, so maybe we go to eat some sweets or buy some clothes. I don't against that, okay? I also like sweet, I also like to buy clothes, okay? But if you run this, if you manage this, or your feeling manage this, that's the only difference. So something up here, okay, just see it. That's very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was wondering how the Israel surrounding took you when you went back there to teach Zen and as far as I know it is also not a surrounding of uh, not doing something when somebody does something to you I'm referring to night to night tradition there so how does this surrounding or is it just a preconception of mine that it is a bit it might be quite difficult for it to take Zen in. And what was your, what is your experience with? It? How big is the Sangha? How many are practicing with you? And uh, what are the basic uh, difficulties or not difficulties with that? And especially, how did it begin? Okay, let me ask you a question, please. What is not Zen? 
Only that? You are looking at me. <laughs> okay, this is later you check which one answers <laughs> name, okay? Because <laughs> it's <laughs> come see, come see, like that. <laughs> what I try to point in that question, that Zen can be everything. I can teach everywhere. If you understand the principle, you can add everything on that. I will share with you, I do some volunteer work in hospital. I work with people with cancer. I don't come to teach them over there Zen or Buddhism. I want to teach them tools how to handle their situation. They deal with their body, okay, weakness and tiredness, cannot eat, okay, because the chemo and all the stuff. And we just teach them tools. And when they see that we just want to help them and we don't bring this beautiful Buddha with us, we don't put incense or candles, even that I will really like to do it. So there is the surrounded you can take away and just give the, the bone. And they take it with two hands, with all their heart. So if you really understand that there is nothing that is not Zen, you can do everything. You can teach everywhere. I can teach in synagogue, no problem. I don't come with these clothes, you understand? Okay? I don't talk with them about Buddha nature. It will be offended. But I will talk about their mind. I will talk about their feeling. I will talk about their family situation. I will talk about becoming one with God. What's different? So you can play with things, but don't lose, you know, your direction. The point. Don't lose the point. It's like in conversation. Don't lose the point. This is how I do it. So it's growth. It's going and it's growing. We have like a, a activity called Shabbat Zen, which means Shabbat. It's like today, okay? And it's for, open for everyone. So sometimes 100 people are coming and we are practicing and I teaching. And of course, in very short we cannot sit 50 minutes. Most people cannot do, cannot do that. And most people in my Sangha sit on sh chair. Some of, some of them are really old. I have a very young student. He's 82 years old. He's coming here quite often, yeah. Okay, Woody know him and John also him. And, and we always say, maybe in your age I will practice like you. Wow, it's amazing. <laughs> okay, so you adapt the situation. There's no problem. And if, it, if you do something wrong, it's straight away. It's come to you. Don't worry. You will know you're on the wrong path. You may change very fast. So I like that. I like that, that I have the freedom to change and to work with people according to their situation and to understand who is sitting in front of me and work with him about what he wants and connect it to the practice. I think uh, Zen Master Sun Sun was... Uh, really specialist in that. It was really amazing how we did it. So we had a wonderful training in, in South Korea. So we can work with that. Thank you for the question. Thank you for all your question and your practice and your effort and uh, that in your silence you accept me here with you. So thank you very much. <laughs>